Introducing the NS Micro Clip-Free Tuner. It's a discrete headstock tuning solution that stays put and stays out of sight. Tune up quickly and discreetly. Hey, what's up guys? This is Perry with Premier Guitar here in Nashville, Tennessee. Today we're taking, talking to Cody Bonnet of As Cities Burn. How's it going, Cody? It's good, man. Man, good great to, to see you. Here. Thanks We've for having me. We've been friends me. for a long, long time, so this is, a, yeah. this is cool that we yeah, get to sit down and do cool. this. So, um, when we were kids and everybody was road-dogging it, you, you were one of these guys that kind of changed my approach to tone because when everybody else was lugging in, um, you know, Mesa Boogie full stacks and stuff, here comes Cody with like a basement and a telly and, you know, I hadn't, at that point in my life, you know, I, I guess my idea of heavy was like totally different. So, you know, um, seeing, you know, you grow as a guitarist and a writer was super inspiring. Guys like you and Tapi Taranishi kind of like reshaped mm. my idea of what a heavy tone is or could be. Yeah. Um, so good on you. What got you into like, uh, you know, going from metal stuff to like, you know, Single coil pickup. Sure. And, and uh, actually, the first guitar I bought was um, this is an American Telecaster that I play mostly and it has single coils. But the first one I bought was a Mexican Telecaster, uh, just you know, a little bit lower grade, but same style, same uh, type of pickups. Um, and I, I always found that when I would try to go to a, a humbucker, that whenever I would play like some of the more like jazzy type chords or like little picking parts that it would get a little more lost than I wanted it to, right. you know, like you wouldn't be as clear. So it's like, dang, maybe on the heavy parts, it doesn't sound as big because you got just like a single coil jangly chord. Um, as opposed to when you're playing with the humbucker, you got like a thick grit to it. Uh, but we did mostly picking stuff. So like, that kind of worked better for our band. I would rather sacrifice maybe the heavy on the heavy parts right. for the clarity on the parts that needed to be that way. And um, our basses would have like fuzz or something or Just a rat the, pedal right, on the right. bass. So that kind of like would serve as like a little bit of the thicker texture, you know? So that's how we, we made it work. But uh, I always just like personally the clarity of a single coil and oh, man. it's kind yeah, of what's going on here. You can't stop it. I mean, at the, at the time, that, you know, Sun, I Loved You came out, you know, there wasn't really, there weren't bands really, you know, having a, a real articulate tone when it came to like single string stuff and stuff. It was just kind of like Marshall's loud, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, man, I, 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 didn't, I didn't really know, I didn't know how to put it that way in the words and I didn't, certainly didn't put it that way, but um, I actually tried to record that record with this guitar and the, the studio that Goldman had had some bad, uh, Matt Goldman, uh, our producer, had a bad like ground or power, power system, mm -hmm. so it would make the single coils Buzzy. buzz pretty yeah. badly. So the guitar we actually used on uh, that record was a um, Les Paul Special with P100s, which right. are like noiseless humbucking P90s or noiseless or something. something. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Um, and, and so it mimics a single coil sound, even though it's not. Um, I think we may have gotten away with a couple parts on that or something if, if it was worked but um, our, our other guitar player that did a lot of the rhythm stuff, he did have, I think he had a Fernandez, um, I don't know, <laughs> Fernandez something or other that we used a bit for some of the more gritty parts. And then Goldman has like a couple cool SGs and uh, Les Pauls and Guilds that like could, we pretty much just used all that he had, yeah. you know. Um, but since then we've made our own little cl collections. Yeah, yeah. So are, are you still working with Goldman? Uh, we did on this last record. Which we sounds did. phenomenal. Good job, Matt. Thank yeah, you. Good, yeah, good job, Matt, Matt did a, an incredible job. Our new record's called Scream Through the Walls. It just came out on um, Equal Vision in June. Yeah, and special, extra special thanks to everybody at Equal Vision to, for setting this up, this rules. Yeah. Um, um, blast working with him again. We've made three of our four records with him and 
I, I'm of the mindset that like the more you or the less you have to talk about and the more you just do like the more uh, fluid the machine works you know right. like you're um, I, I like what he does he might like what we do and it's like not much like hey why don't you change this part drastically or change what you do well drastically it's like I, I love the way he makes records so, yeah I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of his work for sure are you doing a ton of pre-production like are you mapping the songs out and then taking them to him in a demo form yeah we would do some form of that bringing it in and then we spend about a week once we start recording uh just playing live together and then record a very rough just go get through the song and then there's some cutting up and moving stuff around and maybe some finding the chorus and developing the chorus or right. whatever you know um refining the song a little more uh and then we get into drums bass guitar vocals Kind sure. of in that order, you know, it's kind of a lot of flip-flopping. So, so I guess that that approach is probably a lot more common than it used to be. So like as, I think this is an important question because like as um, a primary writer for a band, um, do you guys all live here now? Yes. Okay, do. cool. Because for, I mean, you guys are from Louisiana, but you know. Right. So is it, are you writing these songs, getting together with a guy, showing them how to play the songs, and then getting it tight? Or are you like... Just, Mailing this, them, you know, stems or how is that working? This time, we, this album was probably the most collaborative album. Um, we would, we all have other jobs and stuff. You know, the band is sort of like, um, it's, it's not on the back burner or anything like that. But for a year or two, year and a half or two years, we would meet once a week and play for about two hours in the right. middle of the week, you know, a Wednesday, you know, from two to four or something like that and try to work on one song and then the next week we'd have been working on a little bit on our own and come back and bring it to the table and it's slowly chipping away at this thing. But uh, on our previous albums, like, I, I guess I would just not have a job during those times because we were young enough to live with our parents and um, I would just sit in my room and play guitar all day and have this little four track and just unload on it. And so I could have like a fleshed out part with bass, guitars, and sometimes drums on it uh, and bring that to the band. Now it's kind of like, I just have this Here's intro this riff. Oh, yeah, let's work like, on it. And, and we'll, we'll see. And I liked that better because it, 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 it let everybody else have more of a voice in it, which I, I never really wanted to be in my own band. I like to be in a band with um, right. that dude doing his thing that way and really letting the other guys shine, you know, and uh, our new guitar player, Hunter, really, really brought in some excellent parts and is kind of the guy that, this is our first record with him and like we didn't have to micromanage him or anything. He just, just like would in come in and like, I, I love what you're doing, I'm not even looking at yeah. your hands, I can hear it. it he's a great, great. player, man. Yeah. And he's really fun to watch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like and, he's got great stage Very presence. accurate, yeah. very, very good player, yeah. And um, Stephen Keach, he was in the band Haste the Day, um, and he he played bass, which uh, he's not typically a bass player, you know. But he uh, he brought some great bass tracks to the to the album, I believe. You the know? rules is he a touring member now? No, he uh, he had a kid, and he has a good job here in Nashville, so he wasn't able to tour with us at all. But um, we have this guy Joel Parks, who's a local Nashville dude, and he. He's really, <laughs> he kills it, man. Like, we just did audio feed, uh, or audio tree, I'm sorry. Uh, and he, like, I never have him in my monitor when I'm playing live cause, uh, with his vocals, because I don't really want to uh, throw off my own vocals, you know? Right, right. So, like, I never heard what he was doing until, like, we watched that audio tree performance again, and he just sounded so good. Like, yes. wow, you're doing this every night? That's excellent, man. So, uh, it's just... Couldn't be happier with a touring bass player. Yeah, rules, man. Him, yeah. Um, you know, when you're working with, going from making this record, how much of this is um, on that record? Like, are you recording with this stuff or just stuff that Matt has? Or, okay, that's a good question. You know what I mean? Okay, um, so the first song that I just played that uh, is called Contact uh, off um, Come Now Sleep. Come Now Sleep, yeah, the first, first song. Yeah. song. That was made on what this amp used to be. And this amp used to be uh, like reissue Fender DeVille, 412 Blues DeVille. And they're not very roadworthy. This thing bounces around in the trailer enough time and it just rattles loose. And eventually, after five years, it's not going to work anymore. So um, it sounded great. It really did. 
I had this guy from this company called Black Tape Amplifiers. Um, <laughs> That's he, great. he basically uh, he basically makes your speaker make sure your speakers are good in the cab and that the cab is sound, you know. Uh -huh. And then he'll take out what's inside and like there's only four knobs on it now. Right. And and it's a point to point hand wired uh, oh, wow. amp after a sixties uh, fender um, circuit. And that amp is it's similar to that Blackface Bassman, uh, which I've always loved. But on this last record, it decided it didn't want to work anymore. So we used another Blackface Bassman that belonged to Matt Goldman. So yeah, similar, but you know, there's they're always a little bit different, you know. Yeah. What was wrong with it? You had to have it repaired. Uh, yeah, dude. All you know the just wasn't right yeah, it was just like off. dark and like noisy and not loud and just uh it needed caps and i don't even know what's in there but like do the black tape amps do it no another i don't know his name hunter had the guy do it but um another guy from around here and when we got it back it was quiet and it sounds killer now yeah. so I've, I've always seen you with this amp and it's always sounded really, really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, it just decided it wanted to have some things replaced on it recently <laughs> and that's okay, you know, it's like maintenance, like a car, I guess. Now, are you blending these two amps together? I do, it's yeah. Forced, I'm guessing you're running stereo, I'm guessing. Right? Yeah, um, I was told that it's technically dual amp. I don't even know what stereo is, but dual amp uh, is what it... So we go, um, after the tuner, we hit the... Pog, which is octave, and then we hit both of our drives, uh, which I'm running a Warhorn by Walrus Audio, and that's always on, and uh, it's kind of just pushes it just a little bit louder, like maybe a. a Can we hear just booster. that? Yeah, sure. So it's sure. more like a clean boost than a. Than yeah, a drive. yeah, yeah. So. Um, and I even, you know, a lot of times with like. Yeah, it just gives uh, it some oops. Yeah, it pushes it over and there's a cool like compression switch on it that um, is very subtle, but I, I think you can tell when uh, you're doing some picking notes. So that stays on all the time. Mm -hmm. And then to push it over the top, I have the uh, 1981 DRV. Uh, and it's just a great uh, pedal. It's supposed to be kind of like a rat clone. Um, so. Uh, and then a noise suppressor to cut all any any noise any that's kind of coming noise, from yeah. these three guys. Um, Do you feel like the decimator? Like I've, I've used those in the past. You know, well, in higher gain applications, but they have a tendency to kind of like it sucks the the ring out, if you will. You know, right, like as, right. but there's like a sweet spot, I guess. Like the sustain kind of gets cut cut off. But of of the noise suppressors I've tried, that one. That one is the best that doesn't have an effects loop through it, right? right. Like, I don't even know how that works, but I think you can... There's some way you can run some of them to where it'll detect how you're playing and like not, not take then, from it whenever you're trying to be a little more di dynamic, you know? Yeah. Uh, but um, this one is just pretty basic, like one knob, and it does a great job. So from there, uh, it goes into this uh, sw ABY switch. Um, Are you ever turning one of the amps off? Sometimes, if, if it's like an intro to a song, I'll just have one on one, and then whenever everybody comes in, I right. hit both, you know? So, uh, what I like best about splitting is um, Walrus Audio has this excellent pedal called a Julia. It's and, so uh, awesome. Yeah, it, so I'll do. So, wait, that one. So that's just the, hold on, there it is. Oh, wow, okay. Just gives it like a what? gives it a wide sound. Oh yeah, you know? for sure, yeah. Like, uh, very, so you could put the, the, the rate pretty slow, and you have... So that would be the, just the basement, just the basement is uh -huh. playing right now. 
And so, uh, unaffected, and then you do both. And it kind of just like gives it like a little bit wider. And if these are on the opposite, opposite sides of the stage, of the stage yeah. it like fills up the room in a cool way. Yeah, I have um, multiple amp setups, so I think, you know, it's... Yeah, uh, I have both of them going to the Space Echo, which I've always really, really loved, uh, just because it's just like, it's got tap. And then this cool, like... That's cool. Yeah, just like, yeah, I probably... Cool. Probably exploit that. So then um, the Julia goes to this one, the black tape, and then the bit quest goes to the basement, which the bit quest has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight settings. And I, I mainly use it on a reverb setting because it has this cool thing that. Uh, As a freeze. Right. Almost builds a pad underneath it, that's great. Yeah. Does it ever get away from you? Because um, it's interesting to me how that pedal can almost give you I like know, a synth pad. Yeah, but why, why it grabs one, one good note, note yeah, that, like that's that what really I was works that. for it, you know, like the... Depends on like where you have. It depends on where you have one of the six knobs. It, it's right. very. Uh, I also like this ring modulator thing. That's really cool. Um, so. Hold on. Pedal. It's that, hard to it's hard to like tame live, you know, but right. in the studio it's gonna be uh it's gonna it's gonna be really, really uh beneficial. So Yeah, I, f I find like uh, uh ring mods are kinda tricky to use. Mm -hmm. But that one uh, uh, that's cool. Yeah, like um it took me a little while to like there's a fuzz setting and a clean setting, so for all eight uh you know, there's flanger filter, bit crusher reverb, notch filter, ring modulator, pitch shifter, and delay. For all of those, there's another version of it that's fuzzy, and then there's control one, two, and three, and it's just like, I haven't exhausted how much that can do, <laughs> you know? It's incredible. So, um, after both of these pedals, the Julia and the BitQuest, it goes into the Space Echo, and then out of there into this um, Electro Harmonic 720, which is a, just a looper that I right. have. Sometimes little segues, or we've tried to do some looping live. Between is, songs, like yeah. stuff from your album, maybe, yeah. like the interlude yeah. stuff, yeah. Those are fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's always nerve wracking um, playing a loop live when you don't get it right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's so I never scary. get it right. When I see I've people like, people you know, like Imogen Heap and stuff like that, yeah. their whole thing is based on looping. It's like, Oh boy, what if you yeah. get one wrong? I know. After hearing that I know. all night. Like I saw uh, Andrew Bird do what, do it with one of the Green Line Six old school things. DL Four, <laughs> baby, tried and true. I still have one. I'm on That's my like incredible. sixth one because they don't, you know, they don't really hold up. But you know, those things yeah, are great. Yeah, I know, but you could probably find them a dime a dozen now, right? Oh, yeah. Um, love the uh, the expression that you have there because it's it's such a small form yeah. factor. Like, yeah, that one's hooked to obviously the the big quest. quest. Sure. Yeah, and. Uh, it's just a little bit better than having a volume pedal that would take up so much more space. And this one, it has a classic audio is the company that yeah. made it. And uh, it has a cool little rolly knob that lights up. Yeah. You can see it. The indicator knob is handy, yeah, it's, it's especially very if you're good. on a dark stage. Yeah. You kind of know where you're at with it. The only thing I'm bummed about right now is like, I know they have AB switches that have lights on them, but this one doesn't. So it's like, I don't really know which amps are on. And I don't know if they're both on. <laughs> so it's just like, I'll probably, happens. yeah, I'll probably just get another one at some point. But 
Um, this one's really good because it has a phase switch where you could flip the phase when you're running two amps. I was told like that's what you want to do because you could be like harming your sound by being out of phase. Out of phase it's for actually sure. quieter, perceivably quieter. So, uh, yeah, looks like you got it pretty dialed in. Yeah, it's a good it's, board it's, you got going there. It, it's good because um, we usually uh, we're playing with two guitar players, but um, this last tour, our other guitar player wasn't able to come, and we were, it was like too close to the tour to train somebody to learn it scare the hell out fourteen of you? or fifteen songs. It did. It scared me at first, but then uh, our bass player, like he got like a Pog oct octave pedal and would put it on like the high setting sometimes so he could play like higher up on the bass and like like here uh like if you take the dry out and you just have the high octave on so he would do that on the bass where when he would click it on if he's playing up here then it would get into guitar range right. and he would be able to play some guitar parts Oh, with, that's handy. With the, yeah, yeah. with the pog just shifting this range up uh, an octave. Sure, sure. And uh, so he would be able to cover a couple of little signature riffs that like would accent what I'm doing right, sometimes. Right. And that's then a good workaround. Live people see, then nobody was like, oh, I'm missing the two guitars so much. You know, maybe there were moments where it doesn't sound as full. And um, But it was cool to be able to have the bass and the drums really locked in together. And then the guitar, one guitar can kind of like sit and be behind, yeah. be before and like kind of be loose in the pocket and kind of create another space. Whereas two guitars and our other guitar player, Hunter would play humbuck or uh, single coils as well. So it's like, you kind of have two more shrill guitars that are like almost conflicting with each other if they're not really together a lot of times. So what I noticed whenever we were playing one guitar, it would be a little more clear because there wouldn't be two sure. like fighting high right. pitch things. But a lot of time, you're, you're, the melodies you write are kind of like meandering and like, yeah. you know, in and out and on top of yeah. each other and stuff. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, <laughs> and, and also our our singing is is sort of in the frequency of the guitar as well. Yeah. So if you have less guitar, there's more room to put the vocals up top. I think. Sure. So, um, we're going to roll this way again for the next tour we have in September and then beyond that we don't really know what's on the horizon, you know, maybe does, writing some more. Just having TJ, I mean, because you're not only playing pretty intricate parts a lot of times, but you know, you're, you're singing as well, mm -hmm. which is, hard, that's, that's tricky, is having TJ back in the band, like, um, alleviate oh, that? Oh yeah, that's, that's a lot why I love, like, having a front man, having TJ specifically as he can, like, sort of like entertain and like move around and stuff. I find it, if like I'm playing by, by myself and having to hit pedals and everything, it's just like I'm at the mic stand pretty much, right. you know, for most of the time and it's just standing there. You can't there move and, around and stuff, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe that's fine how it is, but like I think there, there's so much energy in the music, you kind of need somebody to, a hype man. Yeah, hype man, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. TJ, TJ's perfect for that, you know, yeah, he's he tall is. and handsome yeah. and just like. And he, uh, I love his vocals. I love yeah. his vocals. So I, I great, really great liked, screen. I mean, that first version of our band, if you don't know um, the history of our band, we started with as a five piece and we had um, a screamer who would do maybe most of the vocals and then I would do a lot of the guitar parts and do some of the singing parts. And then he quit. And so then for the second and third album, I was doing all of the singing and guitar playing. So um, now on our fourth record, he's come back and now he's back um, kind of as a front man and it's, and it's, uh, it's really it's nice a lot of to kind of embrace, shoulders. yeah, embrace maybe all of the sounds of the band and uh, we have like a lot of freedom to, I, I just like kind of leaning back and playing guitar a totally. lot of times, you know, but also like the vocals that I, I do to contribute to the band are like, have now become pretty signature for the what way for the, the sound. sound. For sure, so yeah. Like, yeah, when I, I think of Vassity's Burn, I definitely think of your singing. Well, I don't know. It's an interesting juxtaposition between his screaming and your singing, mm -hmm. and it just happens. I don't know if it's because your brothers or something, but it just happens to like yeah. work really, really well together. You know? Yeah. Well, that's that's killer, man. I guess um before I let you go and get out of your hair, uh, we kind of did this one backwards. We didn't really talk guitars a ton. So uh, how yeah, many listen. guitars are you taking on the road? Sure. Um, I take three. This one, I do for 
uh, old butterscotch there? The old butterscotch. I never called it old butterscotch, but I think I'll start, <laughs> start now. Um, I like it. So uh, this give is me a, the details on this bed. This is a, a 1983, a birth year guitar for me. Oh, so killer. it's 36 years old, just like me. Um, and me. And you. Yeah. All right, We're yeah. Old, dude. We are, um, until we get older. But yeah, it's just a... Uh, American Strat, the, the, the different thing about it is that there's usually another tone knob here, I think, and there's an angu angular jack right here. Right. But for some reason, this just has tone, volume, and then a uh, plug in there, which I like. I actually and prefer that. It's kind of cool. Was that modded when you bought it? It was like that. Hmm. It was just for the short run, maybe. I don't know. I need to look into what other guitars. But like this Surely one. Surely these saddles aren't stock either. Like no, they're, 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 market, they're definitely, yeah. de definitely been replaced. But, you know, it's just same five position switch that, man, a lot of cool sounds out of this. Right. Uh, it's a very versatile yeah. thing. Yeah. I play this one for more whenever our TJ, our singer, leaves stage and we play some songs. Uh, with me singing, this is the one I play because it kind of gets more delicate sounding, you know? Yeah, it's very dynamic, yeah. Uh, yeah. What position are you typically in for like... I pretty much The slinky, the, like, fender things? Kind of the you? middle. Yeah. I like the middle or the second, which is just, just those two. two. Yeah. I, the bridge kind of brittle. gets a little... Yeah, a little brittle. Harsh. harsh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shrill, even. Almost like a... Uh, I don't know, like a... I interviewed uh, Tape Teranishi, and oh, we yeah. were also having this conversation about the single coil, but in a heavy band kind of thing. Yeah. He's playing, you know, baritones are like, you know, I think, uh, cool. uh, uh, bass sixes. Yeah. And um, the sound that it gets because it's a baritone, like that low uh, frequency through mm. that really kind of... Jangly. Yeah. I, you know, those pickups I don't think were ever designed to really be... Maybe it can't support that much bottom end. Really. Right, right. So it kind of, like, it doesn't fart out. It just, it's this tone that's so uniquely thrice. You yeah, know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, it does this thing that's great, but. That's what yeah. it is. I love that's hearing, the, like, I, I think it's interesting for this, you know, the single yeah. coil thing, but this is the number one, right? This is the number one. If I, if I lost every other guitar, I'd be okay. If I lost this one, I'd be sad for several days, I'm sure, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these are all, whenever I. Uh, Whenever I was a kid, I played like football, like Pee Wee football, and we got a helmet, and it'd be a brand new helmet. And he'd be like, I don't want to be this kid with a, Scuff it a up. fresh helmet. So yeah. you'd take your cleat and hit the helmet, but, uh, and it'd be like, you're a poser for doing that kind of thing. But this, like all these, all these beat up, Been like the they happened. Back. This is real. I didn't do any of this, you know? Like, How about this, this big bad boy? That right happened here. on this last tour. Did like, it, really? it was just. I saw this crack in it. It was just like a stress crack or something, and it was like, man, I could kind of like push down on it. I knew there was air under there, so then I just like it it peeled on off, and huh? it just popped right off. Yeah, so I don't know. I, at first, I was like, that's too much. I'm very sad. But anyway, um, this is like American Telecaster from 2004. I changed this pickup. It's a Seymour Duncan 5.2 which rolls off the EQ. Uh, what, I, what I noticed when I had the original pickup in there is that the low kind of seemed a little too low and the high seemed a little too shrill. So it's like an EQ roll off, like, um, I don't know, mid boost maybe. Uh, but it's, it's good. Also bridge, mostly playing for any kind of rhythm. If I'm gonna do some kind of lead or whatever, I like going to the neck pickup because it just like has a spaceship type sound. I love that you know? thing, yeah. It's so um, slinky and like... Yeah, I gotta play like... Uh, this is maybe a uh, riff off our first record that... Uh, Should have had this tune before. <laughs> but it's real. Um, speaking of, what, what do you guys typically tune to? Uh, the first record we did a lot in drop D, but then somewhere along the way we started playing in a half step down, like E flat, e -flat. standard. Mm -hmm. So then our drop D songs started to be C sharp. So instead right. of having to go all the way just up, two, and just go, string, just yeah. and it made it easier to sing and stuff. So. Um,
that's that that neck pickup. Yeah, just it's like so dreamy. Space. It's yeah, like it's buttery. And these thing. are dead strings too. Like yeah. it, it sounds great. Uh, it's I love that guitar. Um, okay, so then this is my newest guitar, which some people think that a PV's lame. And I don't think they're right. It's a 1979 PVT60. I think someone refinished it. it they're it they're like usually um, just natural, like mm -hmm. wood color here. But the cool thing about this guitar is, so um, the tone. If you if you have the tone rolled down a touch it turns the pickup into a single uh into a humbucker so oh. all tune all the way up this oh this is that weird tuning that i did so um and then it turned it it's it's pretty subtle it's pretty subtle. Yeah, but I hear it. Um, That's different. That's so yeah. weird. Yeah, and so, and then this, this back switch, like if you have this pickup is uh, a phase. It puts this one out of phase. So if you're playing with both of them. I think that's correct. And then that's out of phase. Almost gives you like that strat, fourth position, yeah. cracky. Yeah, yeah, it's just like thing. that. Uh, Spaceship sound. I don't Knopfler know. Knopfler tone, bro. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's great. Do you, are, I'm guessing these are whatever stock pickups came in it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's original, other than uh, I think maybe someone changed out the pots and uh, refinished it. But it's been a good guitar. It's a little heavy and it's kind of cool to have. Yeah, it's a chunk of wood, all right. I don't really have a guitar with humbuckers right now, so this is cool that, th that it, it's an option for me yeah. whenever I'm recording or something. And it's cool. I dig it. Yeah. Dig it a lot. Yeah, I've seen a couple of those, but the, you know, not not a ton. I, I, love yeah. that, I love that you're playing that. I got it for cheap. I got it for cheap too. So like buying a 70, uh, 1979 guitar for 400 and something dollars, like that's pretty good. You're not going to really can't be able that. to do yeah. that. And the wood you know. is old and it's, yeah, it's just, it resonates well. Yeah, yeah. Good, good condition. Well, Cody, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk to us today. My pleasure, really, really man. Thank it. you. Um, have fun on the next leg of the tour. Um, sure. Scream Through the Walls is out now. You can listen to it through um, uh, you know, Spotify, all the streaming services, or go to Equal Vision Records and buy that sucker because it's great. Um, stay tuned for more rig rundowns, riff rundowns. Check out our YouTube. Go subscribe to that sucker because it's awesome. See you guys soon.